Look at that plant. I want you to know that everything was grown in my garden. Don't touch that plant! Is it poisonous? She'll become part of the plant. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Flower Power Garden Hour. I'm your host, Marlene. And today I have Dawn Shore on again from Rowwood Barn Nursery. I got a lot of great feedback from people saying, wow, he's so knowledgeable. Wow, he has such a great voice for radio and podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, uh, and you know so much. I'm like, you know what? Let's talk about veggies. And before we start recording, we're already like talking because I think... Um, well, thanks. Thanks for being on. See, it's it's we're, it's, yep. we're yep. getting this. Sm- to- yeah, <laughs> we're getting the small talk out of the way. We're already talking about. I, I mentioned already if you'd gotten the first. Um, is it too late to plant vegetables already? Because yeah. Um, and when do you? I mean, and when we say vegetables, you know, we're really talking about summer veggies and tomatoes because you know if you are gardening in zone nine there's really no stop and start. I mean, because we have a continuous almost year long growing season, but it's the tomatoes and the peppers everyone wants to plant. And a lot of times people, you were just telling me, when is the first time people start asking when you're getting tomatoes in? Oh, we mark our calendar every year and it ranges from late December to early January. This week was, this year it was in the first week of January. And now these are the tomato fans, you know, the ones who are already planning out what their garden is going to be. Uh, But the first sunny week in February, the regular customers start coming in wanting to know if it's time to plant tomatoes because the sun is out and we're in California, so they're ready to go. Now I would remind you all that in the third or fourth week of February this year, we had 27 degrees, 28 degrees, and 28 degrees, three mornings in a row. So that's not just bad for tomatoes, that's lethal for tomatoes. Uh, We don't have that every year, but it certainly did happen this year. And it's kind of funny, as I was getting ready for this, something popped up in my Facebook feed, a memory from 10 years ago. Don, we want you to remember this, and it was a weather forecast that was going to be 35 degrees this week in April 10 years ago. So that's the range, 90 degrees in the year 2022, 35 degrees in the year 2012. And every April is somewhere in between there, including some of those extremes. Yeah. And and a lot of times, you know, people will say, oh, I planted and it was fine. But it's those, Mm -hmm. it's the unsettled weather. It's the fact that we can get these cold spells. So what do you tell people to look for and aim for is it a date? Is it a nighttime temperature? Is it a, do you t- recommend having them go out and measure soil temperature? What, what is, what are some guidelines? Well, all of those work, uh, putting on some shorts, if you're modest and going out and sitting on the ground and see if it's uncomfortable. That's a famous technique that we've been using in the Valley for quite a while. Uh, the good rule of thumb that I say over and over for novice gardeners is in the Sacramento Valley, tomatoes in April, peppers and eggplants in May, we're really looking for the soil temperature for particular soil temperatures, which you can measure yourself with a soil thermometer, or you can simply go to the Simis website, the Simis uh, weather stations, which there's dozens of them around California, and they track it by the hour. So you can see what the current soil temperature is in your region. For tomatoes, I want a soil temperature about 60. And just for the record, we're just getting there. You know, did this year, this particular time, that's where we're getting to about 60 degrees. If you want to go by night temperatures, that might be easier, 50 to 55 degrees at night. Daytime, I like to see it about 80, you know, at least a few times, feeling a little bit like summer. And so by the typical calendar date, that's late April, about the third week of April. Sure, it can be earlier some years, and you're also taking a little bit of a chance when you plant earlier in various different ways, but that's tomatoes. Peppers and eggplant, I'm, form, I'm more concerned about because those really get set back if they experience cold nights, cold soil. So when I say peppers and eggplants in May, I'm really looking for soil temperature around 70, nighttime lows about 60, daytime highs feeling summery like 85, and typically by the calendar, that's late May. So what when you so you know trying to explain to people, um, oh, they don't like cold, and if it's not freezing mm-hmm. cold and they outright die, and you say set back. Can you explain what you mean by setback? Is there actually some roots rotting? Are they yeah. just stunted? Are they physiologically what is going on with them? Yeah. That it's-, it's not so much 
Yeah, it's not rot, it's root injury. Uh, the new white root hairs are injured by cold soil and they stop growing. And you often see micronutrient or even macronutrient uh, issues when that happens. You'll see some purplish coloration on the seedlings that are sitting in the ground uh, simply because the roots can't take up the nutrients. You can't correct that, the roots are injured. And they did some studies at Cornell a number of years ago and they found that each one of those cold injuries that occurs sets the plant's growth back by three to five days or more. So each night that it occurs, you're losing ground. Uh, you really aren't gaining much by early planting. You can take corrective measures to help protect the plant. You can put little things over them to make the air around them warmer. Raised planters, the soil warms up faster. There's a bunch of things you can do to try to mitigate this. But what it does is it injures the root growth, which injures nutrient uptake and slows the growth. And on the tomatoes, yeah, it's a vigorous vine. You know, it'll probably recover. And a month later, you wouldn't necessarily know the difference. Peppers and eggplant in particular, when I've planted them in April or even sometimes early May, the plants I set out four or five weeks later outperform them. And so I, we do see that setback as actually having a lasting impact through the season. Okay. Yeah. And eggplants, I, I tend to plant the latest for those yeah. for those reasons. And we're not yeah. saying that if you've started your seedlings inside that you shouldn't move them outside. We're talking about planting them in the ground. And, and I'm saying, right. you know, nurseries have them now. And people are afraid they're not going to get, you know, because everyone loves gardening right now. They're afraid they may not get, you know, the sun golds or, you know, the the, the whatever ones that they, they're, they want. You could buy them now. Just don't mm -hmm. plant them and keep them a little bit warmer, closer up to the house and then wait until and you recommend. I mean, you gave all those perfect examples. And usually mm -hmm. that's like you said, the third week in in April for your tomatoes. But then just wait a little bit longer. So it sounds like is. You're not doing yourself any favor by planting them earlier. In fact, you could be hurting them. So, I mean, I've planted tomatoes in June before and have had, sure. you know, we have such a late season. Really, our tomatoes keep going and going and going really until a heavy or a mild frost knocks them out. And I don't, well, yeah. I know I'm pretty sick of tomatoes by the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say my biggest harvest month, as long as I've lived here, has been October. Mm -hmm. uh, that's because the plants are vigorous. I've given them deep waterings. They're nice and healthy. And we always get what the local meteorologists like to call the August cool down. There's about a week or so in August where the temperatures are in the upper 80s to low 90s. That has been very consistent over the years. And those are the temperatures which self-pollination will occur. Those fruit ripen seven to eight weeks later. So if your plant is healthy and vigorous and blooming in mid-August, you'll be picking a lot of fruit in October. And that, again, is always my biggest month for harvest here. I do know a lot of people move here from places where their season ends on Labor Day or, you know, September is running late. So they really can't imagine that late season ripening just even being a factor. They may have a lot of green tomatoes when that first frost hits. We have a long season. Yes. We can harvest tomatoes yes. comfortably all the way into mid-October with no problem. And everybody who's gardened here for a long time has had the experience of picking tomatoes and peppers and even eggplants perhaps in late October, November. Sometimes even you like to take a picture of that tomato in December and send that to your friends in the East Coast and say, yes, we're still picking tomatoes here. Yeah, the plant doesn't look so good, <laughs> but you're still got some tomatoes. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you recommend as far as um, amending the soil to get them in the ground, some planting tips. And if people are going to plant them in a container, the size container that you recommend. Oh, let's go with that one because I've tested that <laughs> big way. I have tested every size container you can you can try. And um, to me, the baseline at this point is a 15-gallon nursery container, the kind of thing you'd buy a tree in, mm -hmm. which holds one and a half cubic feet of soil, is pretty much the bare minimum certainly for an indeterminate tomato. That is to say the kind that keep on growing and turn into sizable vines. And even in that, you'll probably be watering it daily by mid-August and right on through September. If it's a smaller type, and there are hundreds of tomato varieties, and there are some compact ones, the determinate types, so we're gonna get, get into a little jargon here, the dwarf indeterminate types like the Husky series, these new uh, cascading ones like Tumbling Tom, uh, Patio, little compact ones you could do in maybe maybe a seven or 10 gallon container. 15 gallon is really to me the minimum. So when I see any new product come on the market, topsy-turvy tomato planter, the earth boxes, things like that, my first question and my only question about whether it's gonna work is what's the volume of soil? 
in this product. If it's anything less than one and a half cubic feet in the Sacramento Valley, in interior Southern California, any place that's as hot and dry, has as much of an evapotranspiration rate as we have here, it's just not gonna work. You won't be able to keep it watered. So that's my minimum for them. But again, if you're really limited, and I have lots of customers who live in apartments and, and condos and such, there are tomato varieties that are fun that you can do in a small container and get a nice sampling of tomatoes. We're talking basic tomatoes. That's your one and a half cubic foot. For putting in the soil, uh, I, I want to see them get some source of nitrogen, but not too much. I don't, in our area, amend the soil heavily for tomatoes because when you go heavy on that kind of thing, you get great, big, robust vines, but it does not improve yield particularly. In fact, it may be growth at the expense of yield in some cases. So here where we have great agricultural soils, we just go ahead and use our native soil and we just top dress with some kind of good quality compost to retain moisture and provide that little bit of nitrogen that they need. And there may be listeners where soils are poorer or especially listeners who are using raised planter boxes where they've brought in a soil and they will need to amend that just because it doesn't hold nutrients as well. And it doesn't hold water as well. So our great ag oh, yeah. soils here tend to be more clay, which right. works. I mean, if, yeah, when it's dry, it's hard to dig into in the summertime. It may not, you know, drain well, but for summer veggies, mm -hmm. keeping that moisture in there. And then especially if you top dress it with a compost or a mulch of some sort to keep the moisture in, you don't need to water as much. But if you do have raised beds and you've added, you know, a potting soil or a 50-50 blend, you're going to yeah. have to, you're going to have to water more. Most of our conversations, we, we quickly realize as we're getting into the discussion about how to water, we have to ask that first question, which we don't think of, you know, at the very start of it. Oh, by the way, is this out in the garden or is this in a raised planter box? Yeah. Because raised planter boxes, they've always filled with something they bought, something mm -hmm. that's basically like potting soil and water simply rushes through it. So in, in that situation, people may even have to water, I hate to say this, daily for vegetables, at least the first year or so as they're getting that sandy, loamy, whatever it is that they purchased where the water just rushes through and doesn't stick around over time yes you can add compost on top you can grow cover crops you can let the roots break down from the crops and the cover crops and things like that and actually kind of create an actual soil there that holds water better but very common experience when you first build those fancy multi-thousand dollar raised planters that you put in you may have to put in a drip system that runs every day at first. Yeah. And as time goes by, the soil will kind of improve itself, actually. You mentioned the fancy $1,000 raised beds, and my husband's just like nodding his head. If it wasn't for gophers, I would not have yeah. raised beds. I absolutely yeah. love growing <laughs> in the natural soil we have here. You know, you mm -hmm. work with it, it, it. But if it wasn't for the darn gophers, because, I mean, they... Oh, they're my... They're horrible. They're my number one nemesis. Yes. And in, in the open soil, what I've done for gophers is I just use gopher cages and I line the holes. But they're, yeah, they're, a raised planter is a really simple answer. You can just put that hardware cloth mm -hmm. at the bottom or you know, yeah. the, the mesh material at the bottom. But it does create this problem. Uh, and for winter vegetables, you know, the leafy greens and things like that, raised planters are great. Uh, they, you can plant, you can water a lot, and the water you know, runs through, but it's okay because it's a cooler time of year. Uh, but in the summertime, they're very challenging and you just have to learn how to water carefully. You gradually acclimate yourself. I almost have to say this to how to water a raised planter because mm -hmm. it really there's such a variation of what people fill them with. Oh, we yeah. sell bags of products that are great that people use. Others may go to a rock yard. They may just buy some sandy topsoil and so on. So water retention and nutrient retention are the biggest issues with raised planters. So. I mean, there's so many things I want to talk about with tomatoes because people just absolutely love tomatoes. And I do want to get mm -hmm. on to peppers, but I want to cover a few more things with tomatoes. Um, one is fertilizing the rest of the season. It sounds like that's a nope. But two, also what they consider taking suckers off, which in my opinion aren't really suckers and pruning. Mm -hmm. I've I've only tried pruning my tomatoes like twice and I've given up because I don't see a point unless that you have a space. So what is your um, feeling on mid-season fertilizer if it's needed? Mm -hmm. And do you remove any suckers? Do you go through and try to prune to one liter or do you just put them in a big cage and call it good? 
I prefer the latter, but uh, I understand <laughs> sometimes, sometimes the reason people will prune, most commonly people are pruning as a training technique. And it's more of an issue in places that have rainy summer climates because they can train them up to a more open structure of some sort and reduce the problem with late blight. That's simply not a huge issue for us here. Uh, fortunately, we're very dry in the summer. So those kind of leaf diseases are less of a problem. Uh, all the studies on pruning of tomatoes have found that it reduces yield overall. There are some agricultural reasons for doing it, for example, to get earlier fruit ripening uh, for a market situation or to get fruit ripening as fast as you possibly can because you live in Minnesota or something like that. Here, I plant them, I put a five foot or six foot cage on them, I stake it securely and that's it. The only pruning I do is if they get in my way as I'm walking down the path, <laughs> more commonly I just poke them back in the cage, but sometimes they get irritated and snip it off. Bear in mind, again, the bottom line is that pruning reduces yield. So sometimes it's done for quality, but generally it has no other particular purpose for us in the arid West. So, I, I love that answer. I mean, that's exactly what I was thinking and I've read too, but I mean, it, it, I mean, they, they're plants that take care of themselves. It's just making sure you have that big giant cage else. You're just going to be pruning them and they're going to flop over on you. Yeah. Last year, for, last year for fun, I planted two tomatoes without support just to see exactly what they would do. Mm. And uh, they, they cover an area that's about six to eight foot diameter. So also it's kind of a hassle to harvest the fruit and a lot of things get at it. So this is a plant that will run all across the ground in nature and in your garden if you let it. Uh, caging him is crucial, really. That's the, the key to, to getting successful fruit that doesn't get eaten by possums and skunks and whatever else is at the ground level. It also makes your life a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. And then staking that cage to the ground because a heavy wind will will knock it over. Um, Second question you had was about you know, fertilizing. Yeah. And only, I would only side dress with nitrogen for tomatoes in midsummer in a raised planter situation simply because of the frequency you're having to irrigate and the fact that it's probably leaching a fair bit of the nitrogen out of the root zone. In the open ground with a soil that holds nutrients well, it's generally the, the only fertilizer I give the plants is at the start of the season. That's tomatoes. Now, I do fertilize peppers and other things like that to keep them going. But for tomatoes, uh, we find that just the what you provide at the time of planting is typically all they need in a regular garden bed. Well, and let's move on to peppers because a lot of questions, people love to grow yeah. their peppers. And a lot of questions I'm sure you get is just the yield. The yield yeah. just isn't there. Why isn't, and you know, you get that with tomatoes too, but why aren't peppers setting at all? And, and my experience with it is, Possibly, like you said, they're planting too early and setting back because mm -hmm. my huge, especially last year, the harvest came way late. Um, yeah. But yeah, to me, go ahead. To me, peppers are a late summer and fall harvest. First of all, that's the main thing. They really love the heat to get going in terms of growth. They do have some temperature sensitivity for pollination as tomatoes do. So sometimes extreme heat will prevent them from setting. More commonly, what I, the complaint I'm getting is sunburn on the peppers, yeah. sun scald on the fruit. And when we have extreme heat, which I'm guessing we'll have more often in the future, <laughs> we, yeah. we see problems, especially with bell peppers. I mean, I'm at the point as personally as a gardener, I don't plant very many bell peppers. I plant the newer garden peppers like gypsy which is a very productive, very reliable pepper, ripens quickly, uh, thinner skinned, but doesn't seem to sun scald as badly as the regular old fashioned bell peppers. And that's been a problem with bell peppers forever. I mean, this isn't just a climate change thing. Yolo Wonder variety, which is obviously introduced here in Yolo County, uh, was introduced because of its shorter stature and the fact that the foliage, at least ostensibly, shades the fruit. But you get a 105 degree day and that bell pepper is exposed to the west, it's going to sunburn. Uh, so I I have found that the other, the newer ones, garden salsa, uh, gypsy, all the Italian types, sweet Italian, the sweet Spanish peppers, the other types of sweet peppers have always done better for me, honestly, than bell peppers. Yeah. Well, I think it's the, the surface area too is greater. So you just have that, yeah. that, and like you said, it's a thinner skin. This is the, last year was the first year I thought about even trying to shade my peppers um, just because it was so hot and, and, mm -hmm for sunburn on the fruits, but also I was just wondering if it would help the plants. Have you ever, I you know they love the heat. So you always hear, oh, they love to heat, but then they, they sun scald. And sometimes, you know, the plants aren't as robust as I would like them to be. And there's the foliage isn't there for them to be shaded. So have you ever just put a, like a 20% shade cloth over 
your your peppers? Um, I have not, but I have. I recently noticed on uh, Facebook that one of the local farms in the Cape Valley that grows organic produce is shading their peppers mm-hmm. this year to try and increase their usable yield. The issue is that if you put the plant in too much shade, it won't yield as much. But if it's in full blinding hot sun, a lot of that fruit will sunburn. So obviously, that's not marketable. And they're actually going to be shading their their fields with I think it's forty percent shade cloth. Wow. What I have done is sometimes plant a few of the peppers where there's a tree or something shading them in the late afternoon and the exact response i've gotten is just what we talked about there's fewer fruit overall but they're all usable so there's that trade-off there and the main thing that i do see with peppers is uh they don't yield real even moisture so in that situation you may have a problem with um, um adequate yield if you put them in too much shade or if you don't water them frequently enough Got it. Got it. And so you mentioned though, that you do, you do mid season fertilize your peppers. Do mm-hmm. they just require that more than? They do. Yeah. I found that to keep them producing long into the season, all the way into November, which is a pretty typical condition for my peppers, uh, that, that fertilizer in mid July side dress them with something. It's usually an organic fertilizer that I already have for some reason. It's usually a five or 10% nitrogen. Nitrogen is mainly what I'm after. And I just cultivate it in, water it in, and then run the drip system. And that does seem to make a difference in that last big push of peppers that we get here in October and even into November. Got it. Okay. Cause yeah, people love their, their pepper. So I think I am good. I 40% shade cloth. It seems like a lot. I think I might start with, yeah. <laughs> I think when they come in like 30, 30%, 20, 30%, 30%, 50%. 50%. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think, you know, what I've also found is a lot of people are jumping over to these new more gourmet peppers and getting great results. Shishito, which mm-hmm. we didn't even sell 10 years ago. Padron, um, the Jimmy Nardello, Carmen, Carmen's a great one. Some of these are hot. Some of these are, are sweet. Uh, shishito is fun if you want to play a little bit of roulette because 10% of the seedlings are very hot. <laughs> the other 90% are sweet. So that's an entertaining thing to watch your guests go through. And Padron is apparently much the same. But these are just very phenomenal producers. Uh, don't seem to burn badly. I'm not going to say they're drought tolerant, but they yield well under a wide range of conditions. I'm I'm gonna I'm just going to throw out the shishito is an amazing amazing, yeah. um, productive plant with no sunburn. Um, it's crazy how much it produces and a, on a fairly small compact plant and about the, uh, the percentage, I think last year I, I didn't get a single hot one, but my husband <laughs> did every time I gave him one. Um, and I think the, the, uh, the Padron, um, those are, I think I get more heat coming off of those. Um, yeah, but yeah, as far as I can- as far as I can tell, Shishito and Padron appear to be basically the same pepper. And what it is is their seed, their seed strains, although there are some hybrids now within, at least in Shishitos. And this has been one of the fun aspects of it. In Japan, apparently, they're incredibly popular in bars because it's a funny thing when you're sitting there drinking to have one pepper out of 10 suddenly, you know, blow the roof of your mouth off. <laughs> I, I think they're fun and, as you say, incredibly productive. Mm-hmm. I've had people come back and tell me, I got 50, 60 peppers on one plant. Now, that's a well-grown plant, but it can happen with a shishito because they're not very big. They don't, yeah. You're not counting on the plant to produce a large, meaty pepper. You're producing a lot of smaller peppers. Yeah, no very yeah very possible to get like 50 off of and it's just continuous too you're just like picking them all the time so um yeah i'm i'm all for the shishito and they're and they're really good too you you could just you know saute them just with even almost the stems on them um, so they were throw, they're a class one for throwing on the grill, throwing yeah. in the pan. And then I do want to mention of the super hots, this is probably really important for that small percentage of the of the population that likes habaneros and things that are extremely hot. They do not like cold soil. I don't even put them in the ground until June. I know that the growers who do them in greenhouses keep the greenhouses at 80 degrees while they're germinating, and at least in the mid-70s while they're growing. So the chinense peppers, as they're called, the habanero, the Carolina reaper, all that crowd really need warm soil. They do very well here. We have a good long season, so you'll get probably as many as you need, uh, but you really shouldn't even bother putting them in the ground until the soil is hitting about 70 degrees. That is really good to know because I get a lot of questions about um, that, and I've had, you know, when I've... I mean, I've planted a few. I mean, I planted a ghost pepper a few years ago. I don't know why, 
because <laughs> I mean, really, yeah, it, it was like I had to show my husband multiple times. Don't just pick this one. Don't pick, you know, I warning <laughs> skull and crossbones. And I ended up eating one on a dare. And Ooh. yeah, Ooh. I, and it, the funny thing was, it wasn't as spicy as I thought, but it did a number on my stomach. Um, yeah, that whole that whole group, they're they're dangerous, actually. And yeah. in my opinion, when someone's buying a habanero, they need to know this is not something you just put out in the garden as if it's any other pepper, because some kid could go out there and really get hurt. Exactly. There's lots of, good, lots of good hot peppers that people can grow. Jalapeno, Fresno, you know, Serrano, normal people can handle those. Mm -hmm. These are the Carolina Reaper crowd and the, you know, the habanero. They're beautiful. They're actually fascinating and lovely plants, but dangerously hot. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to mess with them, but that's good. 75 degrees for soil. That yeah, that's good to yeah. know. And, and, you know, we, th these are perennial plants too. So if you do grow it, you could, you know, try to keep it over winter if possible. I've never had mm -hmm. great luck covering them in the ground. Um, just cause I'm a little bit colder than sort of in the, uh, you know, the suburb area, but in a yeah, pot, you know, in a container, you could bring it inside and get a head start, but it seems, yeah. like, it seems like every year someone tells me about some of their peppers that went through, perhaps because they have them in a container closer to the house or, yes, in town. Uh, my own, I had one pepper actually go through the winter this year, and I didn't really do anything special for it, but it, it was the one that was closest to the house. So these are subtropical soft shrubs, basically, that can be grown from year to year. And it doesn't take that much to get one through the winter. Uh, it does need to be either covered over or closer to the building or something to get it through a night that was 27 degrees did take out all except this one. Got it. <laughs> I had I had a couple of years ago an eggplant just over winter. And there you I, go. <laughs> it was just bizarre because it was just some random eggplant that I'd cut down and I was too lazy. And I'm like, oh, I'll just leave the roots in there. And it popped back up. So I'm like, Okay. So well, I recommend doing that with all of your vegetables. When you get when the season is over, cut them off. And this is really simple, a great way to build soil. And then you sometimes get this nice bonus. Cut it to the ground instead of pulling it out. Take the tops away, you know, compost them and let the roots disintegrate in situ, as we say, right on the site. And that's the simplest way to amend your soil that I know of. You get a deep-rooted plant, uh, particularly something like a tomato whose roots have gone two, three, four feet deep and out. You cut it down, and that's just the simplest way to make macro pores in the soil and improve the soil drainage and uh, soil water penetration, water retention as well, because it's organic material. So I long ago stopped pulling out plants at mm -hmm. the end of the season and started cutting them down. And every now and then one will sprout up for you again. Yeah. The only time I don't recommend doing that is if you're, if for some reason your tomato plant is acting right. weird, because you do want to check for root, not nematodes, you yeah, know, if it, up and look at them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, for the most part, that's organic matter. It's going to, it's going to break, it's going to break down. Um, and you may, like you said, like what happened to me and happened to you, things may even sprout, sprout up. Um, can we talk about beans? Sure. Mainly because my beans just, I don't know. I, I'm just not a good bean grower. <laughs> I, <laughs> well, I, I'm they're good. heat sensitive. Yeah. This is true. They are sensitive to high temperatures with respect to pollination. When I first moved to the valley from coastal San Diego, uh, the bean I grew up with was Kentucky Wonder. My father planted that every year. It did great, produced all summer long, and we just loved it. And I moved up here and I planted it, and they were blank. There was nothing in there. They didn't develop well. They would flower and they would either not set or they would set and then there'd be no beans in the bean. Mm. And uh, someone quickly told me, no, no, here we grow Blue Lake. And it is true that Blue Lake bean, which has been around forever, is much more tolerant of high temperatures than Kentucky Wonder. I also grow Royal Burgundy because it seems to be somewhat more tolerant of high temperatures. But we start getting consistently into the 90s. The beans will grow fine. They'll flower. And just like some tomatoes, those flowers will fall off without properly pollinating. Or they'll pollinate, as I say, and there won't be any beans in there. So I don't think it's anything you did wrong. They're not <laughs> drought tolerant, but they're also not particularly heat tolerant. And there's a couple other things that do go wrong. As the season goes along, you're sure to get thrips on the plants. You're sure to get yeah. spider mite. You're sure to get white flies. So I have gone personally to planting bush beans. Blue Lake variety is my preferred one, although I like the Royal Burgundy and I always try others. I do some as early as possible, like now. I do some again a few weeks later. I do some again a few weeks later. I kind of stop midsummer and I do one more planting typically in late August to harvest those in October. And that way I'm skipping the heat because that's really the issue with beans. They really don't like temperatures for fruit set anyway, above about 90 degrees has been my experience. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. I mean, I knew it was probably something to do with heat. I have horrible leaf hoppers with, yeah, with that. Yeah. The yeah. Chinese long beans um, do really well for me. And I think it's because they set so early and they mm -hmm. have yeah. a much quicker, I mean, it seems like they have just one big harvest and then the plant dies. So I think it's missing the heat, but. Part of it, well, part of it is they are subtropical uh, mm -hmm. more so than beans. So they can take it hotter to some degree. You're right that keeping up with them can be really challenging because yes. they can set so much that you stop picking any bean, it kind of stops producing. That's why I've done bush beans, by the way, for the regular green beans. The pole beans, I could never keep up with the picking. Okay. And well, they may, have, they may have yielded like crazy. They just weren't any good because I couldn't keep them picked. You're right though, asparagus beans, uh, set well, pulled well, and harvest over a pretty long period. Yeah. Totally okay. different beans, actually. So. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Um, I'm, I'm just going down, I'm just going down the list of what, what vegetables I know and thinking uh, about the problem. Alphabetically, how about cucumbers? <laughs> I, I wish I was just about, I mean, I wasn't out. Yeah, that's true. Uh, cucumbers was actually next because people, I mean, people have, you know, you we tend to hear the problems people have more so than them just saying, hey, wow, this is great. So maybe in my mind, every time I hear cucumbers, I just hear all the complaints. Um, yeah. What are some, some of your favorite varieties for cucumbers? When to plant them? Because they're sort of, you know, we know exactly when to plant, you know, tomatoes. We And mm -hmm. then cucumbers are sort of out there in this almost like, oh, I'm just going to plant them when I plant my tomatoes. Is that correct? A little bit later, they like a warm soil. They take off when you put them in warm soil. So I generally put them in right about the same time I'm planting peppers and eggplant. And I'll tell you, the only kind of cucumbers I don't grow. I love cucumbers. I plant 25 or 30 plants every year so I can give them away to everybody and do whatever I want with them. Wow. I've stopped growing regular green cucumbers. Hmm. Those are the ones I don't grow because they're prone to bitterness. And the bitterness of cucumbers is really the biggest issue. Everywhere you look on extension publications and online, people will tell you, oh, it's the way you're watering. Well, I, you know, I know I've watered evenly. What I have strongly correlated bitterness with in cucumbers is high temperatures. And so when we have a heat wave, I know the regular green cucumbers that are developing during that heat wave are going to be bitter. I don't get bitterness on lemon cucumbers, an old heirloom variety that I'm particularly fond of. I rarely get bitterness on Persian cucumbers, which are really worth growing. If I were sending a, a new gardener to one cucumber that's almost sure to do well, I would say look for one of the Persian cucumbers or one of the hybrids like Diva, because those are very consistent and reliable. The only issue is you got to keep them picked because they're relatively small and they develop quickly. I also really personally like all the burpless types, which is a, a catch-all phrase for the long Long green ones that have uh, limited seed cavities and very thin skin. So there's English, Japanese, and other burpless types of cucumbers. Very rarely get a, a bitter one on those, and they do quite well here. So I would just basically focus on Persians, Diva in particular, and the so-called burpless types. And, and I always grow lemon cucumber because I think it has great flavor, but you got to pick them quick before they turn yellow. Their best flavor is just as they're beginning to have a hint of yellow. Okay. Just right. Yeah. Because the lemon cucumber, I stopped growing lemon cucumbers mm -hmm. um, mainly because I got feedback from my husband that they're, they're very meaty. Like, or I was probably mm -hmm. picking them when they were too big because yeah. I, I yeah. you know, I don't go out in the garden a few days and all of a sudden it's like, dang it, these things are huge. I well, that, At that stage, they're perfect for throwing for the dog. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, I really wish I had better memory and had a better uh, organization because I grew the best cucumbers last year. And, mm. and I, I want to say maybe they were divas. I can't remember but they, no bitterness, except for every yeah. once, every once in a while, you know, when I, I left a few of them pushing the limits, but um, that's good to know that. And when you say the Persian, is that like the Armenian cucumbers or is that? No, that's it. Armenian is a fun one. I grew up for my son who has begged for it ever since he was about five and he's like 35 now <laughs> and I still grow it every year for him. It's not actually even a cucumber. It's technically a muskmelon. Okay. It's an interesting fact, but it has a flavor like a cucumber. Mm -hmm. It has a very reduced seed cavity and it stays firm even when it's huge. That's what he likes about it. I can hand him a two foot long Armenian cucumber and it's still perfectly edible. It's an extremely vigorous vine. If you've got a wall you need to cover with something for the summer, 
it'll do the job beautifully and uh, very productive. Generally speaking, people find just a single one will last them for several days, but it's not technically a true cucumber. So it doesn't have the real cucumber flavor. Mm -hmm. It has the texture and the other qualities of cucumber. Never bitter. There's have, no bitterness. In it. Have you ever tried pickling that? No, oh, I haven't done that one. I've done almost all the others. I will say about the Persians is that uh, you better keep up on those because they get pretty big, pretty fast for pickling. You might make chow chow or one of those relish type recipes okay. from it, uh, but they are extremely productive. If you're and pickling cucumbers, by the way, do great. And we expect them to be bitter. That's just the nature of the thing. But when you pickle it and put all that salt in there, that masks the bitterness. Uh, pickling cucumbers do very, very well here in the Valley. But again, as with the others, you got to keep up with the picking, which is one of the consistent themes in summer vegetables. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so let's just go down. What What's the next vegetable you want to talk about? It's uh, squash. It's, yes. I, I think would be the big one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Summer squash and all of its permutations. You know, the one I've kind of stopped growing is zucchini. And part of that is that I find that it grows really big. It produces heavily early in the season. It does seem to stop producing when it's very hot. And yep. of course, then you get late, the late summer overwhelm of zucchini. But other summer squashes are more consistent for me. The patty pan types, like the yellow one called Sunburst. Almost all of these other summer squashes I have actually found more consistent here in the Valley than uh, the, the regular old fashioned zucchini. I mean, zucchini is great and it does well and you'll get plenty, but you'll find this long gap in production. It's been so consistent for me that I enjoy growing the patty pan more. And Sunburst is really nice because it's bright yellow, so you can see it even when it's only two or three inches across way down there in the plant and harvest it before it gets too big. And if you let it get too big, it makes a great decoration. Yeah. Or, you know, you just, you know, put add, you add more butter to it and right. it's good or yeah, mix it up. So when we're talking about squash and zucchini and the first thing that comes to mind, one of them is white flies. Yeah. Do yeah. you, I mean... Is it just something you have to deal with? Do you have any magic tricks? I, I know having a, a healthy garden, but. It... Well, in my case, the white fly problems do solve themselves because I do have so many beneficial insects, mm -hmm. which is a whole other another show for you yeah. at some point. Different ways we've managed to draw in ladybugs, lace wings, leather wing beetles, and all the other things that feed on white flies. You know what really feeds on white flies? Dragonflies. They are entomophagous and they love to eat adult white flies. Mm. So if you've got a water source nearby that's drawing dragonflies in, they can often take care of the problem for you. I don't like people to be spraying things like neem or oils on their vegetables because not only is there a risk of burning the leaves if the temperatures are high, they also do have some effect on beneficial insects. They're a repellent, they have some reproductive effects. So I don't want people out there spraying things willy nilly unless there's an actual compelling need for it. The old rinsing method works reasonably well, but in the long run, your best bet is to just keep planting more flowers, more ornamental grasses, more of the things that draw the beneficial insects in and solve the problem for you. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a gradual process of building a more diverse, healthier garden that keeps those beneficials nearby so they're there when you need them. I just found the first leatherwing beetle, for example, under my porch light last night. Yeah. Most people don't know that insect very well, but they are voracious feeders on aphids and the larva of white flies. So those guys are very beneficial. And a simple way to have them in your garden is to just mulch areas with leaves that'll break down over the course of the summer where there's some moisture underneath there. That's where their larvae live. So things like that, just leaving areas that are more natural and allowing the beneficials to come along and do the job for you. Yeah. So it's a balance of trying to get this pristine, clean area you know, mm -hmm. you, you hear, oh, to prevent diseases and everything. So, you know, unless you have this uh, specific disease that you know for sure you have, um, and even then it's just a matter of removing that that plant, um, yeah, keep it keep it more natural. And I guess the thing is, is, you know, if you're going to get pests, you sort of want pests, like you said, because you need beneficials. So, but I knew if I didn't address white flies, people would be like, she didn't address white flies. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I just rinse, well, the first part of it is I just rinse them off. And when I say rinse them off, I've watched people take that advice and go out and give their plants a shower. No, no, no. I'm talking fire hose. Here. Yeah. <laughs> you, want, you want, my joke is you want dead aphids and white flies, not clean aphids and white flies. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. want to put some force behind that water and it really does work. I mean, in our garden center, we use water mm -hmm. to manage white flies. 
We, we know what the host plants are, like zucchini, for example. It's also going to be things like a butylon and mint family members. We monitor those, basic IPM. And as soon as we see some, we start a process of vigorously rinsing the undersides of the leaves. Early in the day is when we prefer to do it. And we do that each day for three or four days in a row. This is really the key, knocking down each stage as it moves along. Uh, there's some stages of white flies that are stuck on the leaf really effectively, but as soon as they move to the next instar, they're vulnerable. So you have to do it for three or four days in a row to start getting good results. Another point is when you put that moisture out there, that's really important to beneficial insects to have a source of moisture. So, you know, your ladybugs will appreciate that as well, but not, not just a rinse. I mean, you want to obliterate them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're going to have some damaged leaves, but you know, the plant so can handle hold, it. Hold, you hold the leaf with one hand and you work with yeah. the other one. Yeah. I mean, I, I use at work, a hose blast is, is my best friend at work. I mean, I'll just go and go, okay, I'm just going to blast all those off, whatever pest it is. It's um, also kind of the end of the season when they're showing up. Mm -hmm. I mean, if your zucchini is covered with white flies and you've got thrips on your beans and you've got spider mites on your cucumbers, well, it's September. You know, maybe it's time to start trimming some of those out and, and start thinking about those cool season vegetables, uh, making some space for those. I'm pretty well done with zucchini by August usually, so... I can chop that plant out at that point. Hey, I've got a place for Brussels sprouts. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing is your plants aren't going to look great by the time you're almost done with harvest. They're, they're going to look bad. So when people are like, oh, they're turning yellow, it's like, well, yeah, they're coming to the end of their, their life. The old leaves are, are, uh, turning yellow. So, um, season is winding down. Yeah. yeah. And there's, there's the, the other squashes that people want to grow that what we call winter squash, mm -hmm. which is a misnomer. But those are a vigorous vine, and you can see this yellowing happening. You know, the older leaves are yellowing. As long as the vine is growing well, has good new growth coming, it'll sustain that fruit that's developing. That's the Hubbard squash, the acorn, you know, the ones that we like to harvest and store for the winter. That's where the name winter squash comes from. You can see that yellowing. It's not a big deal if the plant is basically in reasonable, reasonable vigor, reasonable balance, and still has a lot of good green leaves. Look at a pumpkin patch by the time you're getting ready to go in there and start, you know, picking the pumpkin. Pumpkins. There's a lot of yellow leaves, but there's also still a lot of growth occurring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're good. Yeah. I mean, it's, nitrogen's going to move out of the older leaves into the new ones. Doesn't mean yep. you need a, a plant that's all green. So don't just over fertilize. And I mean, I don't, I don't fertilize. I, I top dress with compost and that's it. Um, you know, I always say it's because I'm a lazy gardener, but the thing is you just don't need it. And, you know, you just sort of confirmed that, yeah, you, you don't need it. Maybe like you said, when you have the fast draining, um, because a lot of these, these nutrients can be moved out of the, the soil. Um, but and compost is a really simple approach. Many forms of compost that you purchase contain some organic fertilizer. If you're making your own, I suggest you do what my father would do every now and then, which is go buy the cheapest manure he could find and put some of that in the compost pile. So it becomes part of the compost pile. So your compost can actually be a great source of organic, slow acting, steady release nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And then you just sort of side dress that. And side dressing basically means you just put it next to the plant because some people may not be aware of what that means. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah. Put a donut ring around them if you prefer, if you want to make it sound more tasty. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Compost donuts. Um, mm. I'm trying to think of some other vegetables that, um, Corn. what about sweet potatoes? Well, they, they don't even go in. They don't even ship them to me as a retailer until May. That's a plant that loves heat. Think about where sweet potatoes are primarily grown. I'm ordering mine from Tennessee. Wow. Uh, southeastern United States is where sweet potatoes come from. And they plant them out in really rich soil that's really loamy. And they let them run across the ground and root in and produce a gazillion sweet potatoes. As a home gardener, you should probably put them in soil that drains fast. A raised planter would be fine as long as you can give them plenty of water. They're very vigorous to vine. They're very attractive vine. Another great way to cover a hot wall for the summer. If you wanted to have something, they'll just do it for the season. It's actually in the morning glory family. You're not, uh, so they're actually kind of pretty even mm -hmm. with the bloom. And uh, they take a lot of space, but it can be fun to do. The key though, is they really don't go in at all until we're distinctly in a summer mode. And then they grow very, very rapidly and they do need a lot of water to sustain that vine. Yeah, so... What happens if the foliage wilts at the end of the, that's sort of just a defense, right? I mean, you might've been watering yeah. it and it'll wilt, but then usually by the morning time, it'll perk back up. 
Or... It'll, it, like zucchini, on a hot day, they'll wilt and you'll think they need water. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you should never judge your water need by what it looks like at two in the afternoon when it's a hot afternoon. Uh, early evening, they're already typically recovering from that midday droop. And uh, you really should go by soil, obviously, rather than you know, what the plant's appearance is. But you're correct. They're such a vigorous vine that even if they're adequately watered, when we're in 95 to 100 degree range here, they will droop and look as though they need water. Uh, you've got to learn with some of these big leafy plants to put your finger in uh, and yeah. you know take a trial and poke around the plant near the emitter and see what the soil moisture status is so do you grow the sweet potatoes like you would um regular potatoes do you do you sort of uh, pile soil on top to get them to produce more or is it sort of just um, plant it and let it go and then you harvest all at once yeah, plant it and let it go and harvest all at once. And if you had enough space, you could let it run across the ground, root at the nodes, and you'd get more potatoes there. But unlike a regular potato, this is such a vigorous vine that you don't really have the option of going to the, the old technique of piling soil up, piling soil up, and getting more potatoes that way. You get a pretty good yield, though, and it's actually very fun to grow. It's a space-consuming plant, but I think everybody should grow it at least once. Yeah, it's pretty. And then the foliage is edible as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, once again, I'll say it, I'm a lazy gardener, so I don't even really like, I'll, I'll maybe add soil twice to my potatoes, but then that's about yeah. it. And I'm like, ah, whatever. I, yeah, I've done the whole thing of stacking up the tires and filling it up. It's actually very fun to do. And if you've got kids and you know, want to show them the miracle of, of um, the reproduction of these tubers along the stem, you pull up that first tire and all these potatoes come cascading down. That's very cool. Um, I've only done that a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're so easy to grow here. You know, why bother? Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. And then, you know, then you get a question like, well, they're so cheap at the store. Why even grow them? And then you're like, well, there's a real good reason, which is that they're sweet. It's like corn. They are, the sugar content is highest in a newly harvested potato. You should grow regular potatoes at least once, harvest them, go scrub them, cook them right away. And it is a revelation because suddenly you have something that actually has some sweetness to it. As they sit in the store and on the way to the store, that sugar converts to starch, just like with sweet corn. So it's something where, yes, homegrown is better. Yeah, Believe no. Not, I'm... Even, with, even with potatoes. Yeah, I, I know. I guess that most people, they, they have never grown anything at home. So, you know, like yeah. when they they don't really know the difference. And, you know, and I always like to say, well, because I can and it's fun and it's a fun, I mean, it's a fun crop to grow and you get a lot of different varieties too than what you could just find at the grocery store. You know, you just get the standard ones. Um, oh, there are hundreds, hundreds of varieties of potatoes and actually choosing which ones to even sell is a big challenge because there's so many that do well. And we're in a region where potatoes are very, very easy to grow. I mean, look for familiar names like Yukon Gold, Red Norland. Uh, but for fun, if you've got the space, you want to do it one year, plant some Kennebec, plant some fingerlings, plant some of the blue potatoes. But you will find the freshly harvested ones have a great flavor, just like with sweet corn. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was a kid... Driving through South Dakota, we'd buy the sweet corn and granted, it would start the water boiling as soon as we got home because that sugar was already breaking down. Well, those are the older varieties, but it is true that the sugar was already converting to starch. So corn that you've just picked, I know people who just eat it right out there in the garden. Oh, yeah. It's as, yeah. as can be. And uh, there are newer types that hold that sugar longer, admittedly, but even still freshly picked corn, just as, as with any starchy vegetable or root product, is going to taste better right out of the garden. Yeah, I, I must admit, I actually sort of like eating, quote, raw corn. I'm mm -hmm. like, it's, it's, I like the texture of it, you know, when it's sort well, of here's chewy. A, <laughs> that's a great segue because the one vegetable we haven't talked about is okra. Oh, <laughs> okay. I lots of okra. Do I sell you... lots of okra to people from different parts of the world, especially. And there's a customer I've had for 40 years who's he's Vietnamese and he he buys okra from me every year. Lots of it. I mean, when someone walks up with a dozen okra plants, I know we have an aficionado here. So I've taken to asking them all, what do you do with it? And most of them give me these complicated recipes that involve you know, battering it, frying it, putting it in gumbo or whatnot. He he looked at me and goes, I just eat it. And I said, I'm sorry, wait, what? What? I just eat it. I said, really? you mean like, like right there in the garden? He goes, yeah. And so, all right. I took an okra that season and I snapped it off and I washed it off right out there in the garden and I put it in my mouth and I chewed it up. It's not slimy. The slime comes out when you cook it. So if okra sliminess has always bothered you, try it fresh off the plant. This is amazing. It's a revelation. It's and such it's a pretty, good. it's such a pretty plant. Yeah. I mean, I finally yeah. actually just grew it the last couple of years and I must say I didn't harvest it, but I enjoyed the flowers because it's, it's Malvaceae, right? It's hibiscus. 
Yeah, it's a hibiscus. Yeah. It's got a beautiful flower. There's a really pretty one called Royal Burgundy that's got a beautiful burgundy colored pot. I've been doing like you for years. I just grew it for fun. Mm -hmm. And I'd give them to people who actually liked okra who told me all their complicated recipes. And I said, so is it still slimy? And they said, yeah, it's still slimy. Okay, then I don't care. <laughs> but fresh off the plant, try this. Report back to us this summer, Marlene. Okay, <laughs> Pick okay. Off the so Rinse off the aphids. They'll always have aphids and take a bite. So when do you recommend planting? How heat sensitive is it? Oh, it needs heat. Needs okra heat. is a, okay. from a, it's like watermelon. It's one of the last things that goes in. It needs very warm soil. You don't even bother planting okra until end of May, early June. You can, can plant oh. it all the way into August by the way and it loves the heat it's from northern africa if i recall and uh, this is a plant that thrives in our summer conditions here and as you say the flowers are beautiful the plant's very cool looking very interesting plant yeah. everybody should grow it and everybody should try it once right off the plant you may suddenly find hey okra's okay yeah i let I, you know i just i don't even harvest it so then i'm they get yeah. bigger and bigger by the time i'm like oh i'm like by then they get the the fruit gets or the seed pod gets really hard and then it splits yeah. open and then i'm like well I missed the boat on that, but at least I enjoyed it. Um, well, I have a customer who's in the, the Flower Rangers Club who tells me that they're great at that stage. Oh, I could see that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, it's Get another use for okra. Yeah, another, another, <laughs> yeah, purpose for it. All right. Well, you did, um, you did mention watermelon. So we got to talk mm. about watermelon and melons. Yeah, you need a lot of space for watermelons. Mm -hmm. I've done them because I'm out in the country and I think you're on, you are, mm -hmm. you can yeah. give an eight, eight by eight area to a plant that's going to produce what, one or two nice sized watermelons. They are a space consumer and they can't take any competition. So don't plant your watermelons where other melons are going to crowd them or they'll be shaded at all. You, it's something for someone on mostly on a rural property, unless you plant sugar baby which was really bred for home gardeners. It's a fairly compact plant, maybe four by four, produces one or two of what we call ice box melons, you know, the smaller, uh, let's say nine or 10 pound melons. They're great quality. So that's a good one for most home gardeners. But again, one or two per plant is typically what you're going to get, unless you have room for one of the varieties that wants to run and keep producing all season. They need deep soil. They need to be watered deeply. The roots do go deep. You can put watermelons on the same drip line with your tomatoes. Uh, because they'll like that same kind of deep irrigation by midsummer, relatively infrequently, but, you know, several gallons of water when you do it, and you'll get okay results. But again, if I were choosing a melon for the average backyard, I would do musk melons or Charente mm -hmm. or something that's going to give a higher yield per square foot. And the Charente has become one of my favorites because it's a small fruit, super aromatic. You can actually even grow it on a tomato cage if you want to. Ooh, the fruit are about softball size. They're really rich flavored. So that's a good one for people who are limited for space. And then the other musk melons, ambrosia, the cantaloupes, all the other types of cantaloupes are also very good if you have room for them. Yeah. And something I've learned along the way is, you know, I'll go through like certain seed catalogs and I'm like, oh, that one sounds interesting. That one sounds interesting. I now really don't grow a lot of the quote heirloom ones because there's yeah. something to be said about hybrid melon, watermelons and their seedlessness, if that's a word. Yeah, Nothing. the water. Yeah, every modern watermelon that I've tried is better than the last one, and uh, yeah. the new hybrids are just you know they've got a crisper texture. Even if they're the seedy types, they've got a crisper texture. They've got better flavor, higher sugar content. I've grown the Moon and Stars, which is an old American heirloom. Uh, that's a great one for fun, and it's a very pretty plant. But I suggest if you have the space, sometime grow that one and grow a regular modern hybrid watermelon side by side. You'll find the texture of the older one is grainier. It's not as sweet. So I think this is one case, as with so many others, mm -hmm. where the newer hybrids have some distinct advantages. Yeah, just, just the seed count alone. I'm like, okay, <laughs> this is not fun. I'm getting more seed than watermelon. I do grow one called strawberry. Mm, and okay. it's, it's, it's a really flavorful one. Uh, with very few seeds. So I'm just throwing that out there because every year I say I'm narrowing down the amount of watermelons and melons <laughs> I grow. Every year. Every year. <laughs> and and what does happen is that, you know, some of these are heirlooms, so they come true to seeds. So when I just get random things popping up because I didn't harvest <laughs> them from last year, I can't yep. pull anything out. I'm like, oh, maybe that'll be something. And yep. so I just have this giant mess of a seed, like a, a bed of them. And uh, you're, creating, you're creating your own uh, uh, land race, as we call it. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will say, though, the cantaloupes, man, you have to stay on top of those because when they're ripe, yes. they go yes. from ripe to splitting open 
really fast. Yeah, I always, I always used to plant uh, just ambrosia and I've learned one, they all tend to ripen in a fairly narrow window. And on a hot day, if you see it in the morning and you don't pick it, you get home, it's already split yep. and everything is eating it. So yep. I do always plant with my ambrosia and other muskmelons. I do also plant honeydews and they've ripened about two weeks later so that it stretches my season. They've got a harder skin. They, they've protected better from the elements and from the things that like to eat melons. I mean, your musk melon on the ground is very vulnerable. So I always like to plant at least a couple of the, of those as well. Yeah. Um, I want to circle back and ended up back at tomatoes <laughs> just ah, because, yeah. um, well, they're number one, they're Absolutely. number one. Yeah. Um, you, yeah. you already covered one of them when it was like fruit set, you're not getting fruit set. Generally that's because of the heat, the flowers are aborting and sadly there's not much you could do except for wait until season cools down. Don't, you know, freak out and pull them out. Like you said, once temperatures cool down a bit. Um, but I do need to address the blossom end rot. Yeah. Um, Well, first of all, for high temperature, there are some varieties like champion celebrity, better boy that seem to set at higher temperatures. Blossom end rot is very controversial and it's always very entertaining on social media (laughs) to look at the many recommendations people have for how they're going to solve blossom end rot. And I hate to put this out there, but there is no solving blossom end rot. There's no product you can buy that prevents blossom end rot. Putting Tums tablet, Epsom salts, whatever else you've read. Well, eggshells, of course. It's got to be eggshells. (laughs) None of those solve blossom end rot. This is much of that is based on the old notion now rather discredited that it was a calcium deficiency. Calcium is involved in it, but it almost entirely correlates with low temperature and excess moisture. And so it's a problem with the first fruit that's set very commonly, and it can be on peppers and and squash as well, by the way. Um, And it is a problem that goes away after that. You get the first ones that set because you planted early or it got suddenly cold and those get blossom end rot. You throw them away. The next ones that come along and develop properly do not have blossom end rot. So it just solves itself. And that may be why so many people think the, yep. the tum tablet or the whatever yeah. else solved the problem as the placebo effect. It's just a matter of planting when the soil has got the right temperature, proper irrigation. And I, I've noticed very strong correlation with periods of low temperature as the fruit is in the expansion phase, which is a very rapid phase of development, almost always correlates with blossom end rot. Uh, some varieties are notorious for it, like Roma. The first ones will get it almost no matter what, but the next ones will come along just fine. Is it more of a problem with very big fruit that have to set and expand rapidly. Uh, but again, we have such a long season that even if the first ones all have blossom end rot, there's a very high likelihood the next fruit that come along will be fine. Good. I'm, I mean, that's exactly what I try to tell people. And then they say, well, I did this and my second crop was fine. And that's like, well, <laughs> I bet if you didn't do anything, it would have been fine yeah. too. So placebo effect is very real. Exactly. <laughs> um, so you are, so right now, I think I read that you're getting um, wild boar, um, Brad yeah. Gates, um, yeah. when your yeah. tomatoes coming in. He arrived uh, Tuesday, so they're all there. Okay. And, uh, Wild Boar Farms, he's a grower locally who's produced this whole mm-hmm. series of open pollinated uh, varieties that he's selected, and he sells to local nurseries around the Sacramento area and a couple over in the Bay Area. What tomato are you excited about this year, or vegetable, or a variety of anything? Is there oh, I continue, I continue to tout the Chef's Choice Orange tomato. The Chef's Choice oh. series is amazing, and they're all okay. very good, very high yielders. They're from a breeder up in Maxwell, which is here in the Valley, if you can't remember <laughs> where yeah. Maxwell is. It's a Highway 5 on the way past Dunnigan, and they've come out with the Chef's Choice series, and they're all good, but the orange is, aside from being beautiful and nearly a one-pound fruit in almost every fruit, and produces 40 or 50 in a typical year. Wow. They're firm, they're meaty, they're really rich flavor, they hold up well in salsa, and they yield heavily all season. So this is, in my opinion, one of the best new tomatoes that's come on the market. And I'll give Burpee a, a shout out for their new bodacious hybrid, uh, which I've now tried two years in a row. Good heat tolerance, holds up well in direct sunlight, even in the afternoon. So that's got a skin that seems to tolerate direct sun better and really good flavor on that one. Okay. Okay. Um, and where can people um, listen to you? Because you have a radio show, right? You're still doing that? KDRT. It's 95.7 FM, KDRT in Davis. It's low power FM, but it also broadcasts and podcasts by the same means as we're doing here. Yeah. So see, all the radio shows are going to podcast. And um, and then you, 
for Redwood Barn. Do you guys you guys have a web, uh, Facebook, right? Redwood yeah. Barn. Yeah, most what I really have is a website. That's okay. Got all kinds of articles. Redwoodbarn.com. I've been writing articles for the Davis Enterprise for a number of years since 1999, actually, and so they're all up there. And there's a whole lot of this tomato stuff there. Are lists of my favorite varieties. It's interesting to look back and see how those lists have changed slightly over the years. Some come, some go, but there's some consistent ones on there, and uh, all that information is there at Redwood and Barn. And, and I'm going to say that if you Google almost anything garden related, your articles pop up. So <laughs> especially, I, I yeah, I mean, I was like, oh, yeah, there it is. Um, I know like citrus, like I think your citrus list of uh, um, cool. I, I, and I think I wanted to have you on for citrus and then time just got away. But we'll have sure. to um, do that. But, yeah, you're a wealth of information and, and all your articles are there and information and. Of course, if people are even around the Sacramento area, you got to stop by Redwood Barn because um, you guys have a really good selection of vegetables. You cram a lot in there. and, and We do. We bring a lot of tomatoes for a tiny nursery. Yeah. I have to say, we really pack them in there. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm really into peppers, but you'll find some unusual peppers there just because I'm growing them, you know, and we can talk about that. So we, we like to try new varieties every year. I always try at least 10 or 15 new varieties of tomatoes every year. And I learned about 10 years ago to start writing things down. Yeah. See, so. <laughs> see, I, I need to start doing that. <laughs> I actually have notes on how they've done over the years in some cases. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was I was in uh, uh, Costa Rica and there was this wild uh, pepper and I know it was one that I grew. I knew it was like a tiny, tiny, tiny little orange pepper that I bought little seeds. Pekin? What was that? Little, little Pekin, chili Pekin? It might have been. I think that's what they called yeah. it. But And yeah. I couldn't remember. I'm like, did I grow that? It looks similar. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yes. So yeah. my grandfather taught me to write things down. He said, start writing things down when you're young and you'll be in the habit when you get old. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> but then I have to remember where I put it. <laughs> so um, this is great. This is, I mean, I think people are going to absolutely love this and a lot of information, good information. What I think it does also is, you know, it just, every time there's an expert um, such as yourself who was like, look at gardening doesn't need to be as difficult. You don't, you know, it's, it's, no, that's one of my, that's one of my absolute mantras. Gardening should be fun. You should experiment. You should try things. Every year is different. One of the reasons that I keep track of all this information about tomatoes, I'm never going to judge a variety by one year's performance. I need at least two or three years to see if it's consistent because mm -hmm. some varieties have given me 40 fruit one year and skunked me the next <laughs> year, you know, <laughs> and there, I don't know what the difference was. I think I grew them the same. So there are those different and it's actually one of the fun things about gardening and horticulture. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. So, um, yeah, everyone, hopefully you enjoy this. And until next time, happy gardening.